Elder Neil A. Maxwell has served as a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints since July 1981. He served as a member of the Presidency of the First Quorum of the Seventy from 1976 to 1981 and as an assistant to the Twelve from 1974 to 1976. A lifelong educator, Elder Maxwell was Executive Vice President at the University of Utah at the time of his appointment as the Commissioner of Education for the Church Educational System, where he served from 1970 to 1976. Prior to his church callings, Elder Maxwell held a variety of administrative and teaching positions with the University of Utah. He has written 28 books on religious topics, with one of the most recent receiving a literary prize for LDS literature. Earlier, he authored many articles on politics and government for national, professional, and local publications. Elder Maxwell is married to the former Colleen Hinckley. They are the parents of four children and have 24 grandchildren. Elder Maxwell's keen insights and his eloquent expression are well known to all of us. On a personal note, over the few years of our acquaintance, I have found him to be one of the kindest, most gracious, and truly humble individuals I have ever known. We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. Thanks to all of you for coming in your various assembly points tonight. I feel deeply touched by what has been said and even more by your presence and what you represent. I am not uh, able to respond, really, to the outpouring of love and faith in my behalf, except to try to be better and do better. And I want you to know how deeply appreciative I am of that love and those expressions of faith in, in my behalf. I'm pleased Elder Eyring could be here. <clears throat> he is serving as Commissioner of Church Education, as already noted, and it'll be under his leadership, in my opinion, that the church educational system will become even more of a, a system than it's ever been in the past. And the two uh, phrases that come to mind from scriptures are that uh, it will be knit together as never before and fitly framed together as never before under his leadership. And for Brother Stan Peterson, who watches over our wonderful seminary and institute system, I express deep appreciation. It's, in my judgment, one of the two or three most effective programs in the entire church. I'm grateful President Bateman is here and for his wonderful leadership of a wonderful university. And he'll be part of this knitting together in, in ways that will yet have to be determined, but it will be a special thing. And I'm delighted that uh, Sister Janet Lee is here tonight. She is a gallant lady. The wife, as you know, of uh, our valiant President Rex Lee, a special, special man. And these wonderful stake presents and their wives on the stand represent so many stake presences throughout the church who love the young adults of the church and the youth of the church in special ways. I'm grateful to be in their midst. I take note of the fact that uh, Sister Maxwell and I were privileged to meet at an institution uh, where an institute of religion flourished. What a special day it was for me to meet her. I must confess, I can't tell you what the lesson was that day in <laughs> class. But I'll always be grateful for that blessing among the many that the church educational system has given to me. She has been wonderful as a nurturer and as an encourager in the last year in particular. So tonight, as we're bound together, brothers and sisters, in a satellite system, let that be symbolic of how we are bound together in the entire church educational system, and even more in the increasingly expansive brotherhood and sisterhood of the kingdom of God on the earth. So let us focus tonight on our shared discipleship amid this shared mortal experience, a subject dear to my heart and about which I know a little more than I did a year ago. When striving disciples reflect deeply upon this mortal experience, brothers and sisters, certain realities become even more clear. 
This includes a particular reality, which is my theme for tonight. And that theme is that we are immortal individuals whose constant challenge is to apply immortal principles to life's constantly changing situations. Seen in this way, life's varied situations are more sharply defined. With this perspective, we can improve our daily performances because we have fixed our gaze on eternity and one of eternity's great realities. Though we share immortality, yet our individual traits, talents, and trials, and opportunities and circumstances vary widely. Even so, brothers and sisters, it is ever the case, and it will ever be the case, that whatever a particular passing mortal situation may be, all the individuals involved are immortals with immense possibilities. C.S. Lewis put this so well when he said, it is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. It's a profound quote from Lewis. I readily recognize that you will be living in an increasingly secularized society in which people simply don't see other humans in this light. Many of them don't even believe in an individualized resurrection. I grant, too, that some also assume that there is an absence of immortal truths or absolute principles. These people prefer to view humans as being without real behavioral boundaries. Given these disbelieving views, it's no wonder that the ways of the natural man quickly prevail, whether by giving away to materialism or to the things of the flesh, because these latter individuals are without a knowledge of and a commitment to Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. An eminent Japanese thinker recently looked at our pleasure-centered Western society and wrote insightfully of a dilemma growing out of this sense so many mortals have of planlessness, purposelessness. He wrote, if there's nothing beyond death, then what is wrong with giving oneself wholly to pleasure in the short time one has left to live? The loss of faith in the other world has saddled modern Western society with a fatal moral problem. Nevertheless, as striving disciples, your and my strategic focus must fall on the interaction of immortal individuals and immortal principles applied to life's changing tactical situations. It's vital, therefore, for you and for me, in the words of Jacob, to see things as they really are and things as they really will be. It's interesting, brothers and sisters, that those who have eyes single to the glory of God are the people who see the most, who see the most of reality. But this road of discipleship about which we're speaking tonight is not easy. It requires sturdy, all-weather souls who are constant in every season of life and who are not easily stalled or thrown off course. Likewise, even with this accurate view of the mortal experience, we still need time, we still need the wise use of our moral agency, we still need God's long suffering to help us, all of this in order to gain experience in life in this ongoing process. Amid that ongoing process, you and I can actually come to know for ourselves, like Alma of old, who fasted and prayed many days 
that I might know of myself, he wrote, that these immortal principles are true. We can also come to know through obedience how much God loves us as his immortal children, and it happens just the way President Brigham Young said it would. President Young wrote, how shall we know that we obey God? There is but one method by which we can know it, and that is by the inspiration of the Spirit of the Lord, witnessing unto our spirit that we are his, that we love him, and that he loves us. It is by the spirit of revelation we know this, said President Young. If we can get that witness for ourselves, that we are his, and that he loves us, then we can cope with and endure well whatever comes in the very tactical situations of life. Of course, there are going to be puzzling moments. Nephi, much like what Brigham Young just said, had this reaction when he was perplexed. I know that God loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. We cannot always fully or glibly explain everything that's happening to us or around us. But knowing that God loves us is absolutely crucial. Then, as immortals, possessed of immortal principles, we can overcome the mortal trials, and we can put the pressing things of the day in precious perspective. Besides, brothers and sisters, the divine attributes of love and mercy and patience and submissiveness, meekness, purity, etc., are those attributes we have been directed to develop in each of us. And they can't be developed in the abstract. They require the clinical experiences, those things through which we're asked to pass. Nor can these attributes be developed in a hurry or in an instant. So the scripture that says, all these things shall give the experience and shall be for thy good, refers to the mix of mortal experiences with immortal individuals and immortal principles. And when that interplay occurs, and we see things through the lens of the gospel, then we can see things more clearly and navigate the road of discipleship. Another thing that will happen for each of us is that we will become much more aware of and alive to the many possibilities for doing good that are there in life's daily situations. Even the moments that seem humdrum to us, brothers and sisters, are full of possibilities. Nothing is really routine. I speak, therefore, tonight not only of life's large defining moments, but also of the seemingly small moments. Even small acts and brief conversations count, if only incrementally, in this constant shaping of souls, in this strategic swirl of people and principles and tactical situations. What will we, for instance, bring to all of those moments, small and large? Will we do what we can to make our presence count as a needed constant in such fleeting moments, even in microwave? Do you and I not sometimes say appreciatively of individuals who helped us? They were there when we needed them. Will we? reciprocate. <coughs> the daily discipleship of which I'm speaking is designed to develop these very attributes which are possessed to perfection by Jesus. These attributes emerge from a consciously chosen way of life, one in which we deny ourselves of all ungodliness and we take up the cross daily not occasionally, not weekly, not monthly. If we are thus determined, then we are emulating yet another quality of our Lord of whom we read. And there is nothing that the Lord thy God shall take into his heart to do, but what he will do it. 
True disciples are meek, but very determined. To underscore further what is being presented tonight concerning the mortal experience, one way of looking at the thou shalt not commandments is that these prohibitions help us to avoid misery by turning us away from that which is enticing, but which can be dreadfully harmful and wrong. However, once we are settled in terms of the direction of our discipleship and the gross sins are left firmly behind, misery prevention, it might be called, then the major focus falls upon the thou shalt commandments. It is the keeping of the thou shalt commandments which brings true happiness. True, as the scripture says, wickedness never was happiness, but neither is lukewarmness happiness. Failing to be valiant in Christian discipleship still leaves us without significant happiness. Therefore, our active avoidance of wickedness must be followed by our active engagement in righteousness in order to come to know true joy. After all, man is that he might have joy. It is, my brothers and sisters, very often the sins of omission which keep us from spiritual wholeness because we still lack certain things. Remember the rich, righteous young man who came to Jesus what good thing, Lord, must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. I've done this from my youth up. And then Jesus' searching response, one thing thou lackest. Go and sell all that thou hast, give it to the poor, and come follow me. A customized commandment for that man. It was something he needed to do, not something he needed to stop doing, that kept him from that wholeness. Furthermore, for most of us brothers and sisters, Certain taste buds of our souls have been burned over by sin, and our Father desires that we regenerate these taste buds of the soul by means of repentance. Our Heavenly Father also desires, however, the development of what are presently the many other neglected taste buds of our souls. These, when they are really developed, will bring even greater happiness and true joy. If it were not so, how could we anticipate with Paul that music and that scenery that eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard and be prepared to enjoy it except we have cultivated these taste buds of great refinement. So it is that wickedness is not the only mortal failure. Yes, the avoidance of wickedness is ever important, but the sins of omission also represent a haunting failure. How often, may I ask you, do we speak about the need for repentance concerning our sins of omission? Or how often do we make personal confessions of them to God? There is a memorable scriptural phrase about our need to have faith unto repentance. Faith unto repentance covers both sins of commission and sins of omission. And so the faith of discipleship about which I speak briefly tonight isn't simply for life's crises, though they will come, but rather it is especially needed to ensure our regular repentance. After all, the scriptures are filled with thou shalt commandments and with so many exhortations for us to do good. James, for instance, speaks of pure religion, urging us to visit and bless the variously deprived. Significantly, however, often not quoted when that scripture is quoted, James also declares that those who would do lasting good should themselves also be good. Unspotted from the world are his words. This is no small point. We live in a world, for example, in which some individuals do some good, but do so while breaking the seventh commandment, chastity before marriage and fidelity after. If we really want to do good, we must also be good. 
Instructively in the Book of Mormon, we read about a political leader, Morianton, who dealt justly with his people, but not with himself. Why not? Because of his many whoredoms, the scriptures say. Fascinating insight into the ecology of the soul. The promptings for us to do good come from the Holy Ghost. And these promptings nudge us along the straight and narrow path of discipleship. The natural man doesn't think of doing good. It isn't natural. How many people worry about the car behind them or the person below them? The natural man just doesn't do it. For us, however, these promptings enlarge our awareness of other people's needs and then prod us to act accordingly. This is why I believe when the Lord speaks of enlarging the soul, he adds in the Doctrine and Covenants that it must be done without hypocrisy. Our personal righteousness, more than we know, governs how much good we can do. It is sadly true, as we all know, that many on this planet hunger for bread, but many also hunger deeply to experience the reassuring eloquence of example. That is a commodity for which there is a desperate need, and it is incumbent upon us to provide that commodity as part of our discipleship. You and I all know individuals who do much quiet good by following the scriptural injunction about lifting up the hands that hang down. Some of those hands which hang down once grasp the iron rod and then let go, having simply given up. Hence those hands need to be reached for because they will not be proffered by such discouraged individuals. But it takes faith to persist in doing good, particularly quiet good, for which there is no recognition. Otherwise, without faith, why bother? Therefore, faith in Heavenly Father's plan of salvation is needed not just for life's turbulent, traumatic moments, but also for daily life's seemingly small, but nevertheless defining moments. Will we, for instance, <clears throat> remember our true identity as we move through daily life? How much sin occurs because people momentarily forget who they really are? Will we, for instance, always remember that our uh, behavior must be connected with our beliefs? It must be done without hypocrisy. The unrelenting reality, therefore, brothers and sisters, is that we are never very far away from the need for faith unto repentance, including repentance of our sins of omission. And such faith unto repentance isn't just for next year or next month or next week, but even for tomorrow. One of the seemingly small things I mentioned that we can do is to be more willing than we sometimes are to give the needed conversational correctives instead of engaging in what I call conversational cloak holding by merely going along silently with the prevailing tide of discussion. I recall reading of General George C. Marshall, whom President Franklin Roosevelt appointed to be his chief of staff early in World War II. Roosevelt was a very persuasive, informal man. And I'm told that on one of their first meetings, desiring to be friendly, perhaps even palsy-walsy, he called General Marshall George, to which the reply came, Mr. President, it's General Marshall. You think a little bit about the courage that took but it helped to define a relationship which, by the way, became a wonderful relationship. The small conversational correctives that matter so much. If we have that quality, we'll appreciate what General Robert E. Lee reportedly did on one occasion. He was asked for his opinion of a military colleague. Lee replied candidly but generously 
After which the questioner said, well, he doesn't speak so highly of you. To which General Lee replied, sir, you have asked me for my opinion of him, not his opinion of me. Lee had, as one writer put it, furnished his mind with fixed principles. And you process the tactical situations through a mind furnished with fixed principles, including integrity, and that is the result. Conversations and decisions in which we engage, even if they seem small, expose the heart and the mind and their furnishings. Brigham Young once said, it's hard to hide the heart when the mouth is open. We can be of so much service to others in many thou shalt ways. Of course, the problem is that rendering service takes time, and we're all so busy. Some situations may call for service that somehow seems to be beneath us. Besides, we have other things to do. The thou shalts are so convenient to put off. Who will notice the procrastination anyway? After all, we're not robbing a bank. Or are there forms of withholding which constitute stealing? Consider conversation again. And this conversation was arranged for by an angel. I read to you from the eighth chapter of Acts. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all the treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. And he was returning and sitting on his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Watch the significant language. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him reading the prophet and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? except some man should guide me. And he desired that Philip would come up and sit with him. How many times are we too busy to come up and sit with someone who needs conversation? You and I have divine promptings all the time, encouraging us to do good, but we often deflect them. Instead of doing like Philip, who ran thither. We sometimes give needed physical cloaks to warm people and to cover them. And it is good that we do. How often do you and I give what the scriptures call the garment of praise? That garment of praise is often more desperately needed than the physical cloak. In any case, as we all know, these needs are all around us every day. There are so many ways we can lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. We can also be generous when there are interpersonal differences of opinion. Generosity and fairness are marks of character. Compared to his early days in Parliament, Winston Churchill later developed his capacity to be somewhat generous, including to his rivals. This was seen in his tribute to the deceased Neville Chamberlain, whom he had just replaced as Prime Minister. Churchill had once described Chamberlain as looking at foreign affairs through a municipal drainpipe. Nevertheless, on the occasion of the tribute for Chamberlain, Churchill said, in one of the supreme crises of the world, our colleague was contradicted by events. And Churchill went on to praise Chamberlain, saying, The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. With this shield, we march always in the ranks of honor. How generous of Churchill, contradicted by events, was intended 
to explain Chamberlain's gross failures regards the rise of Hitler. In each of life's situations, large or small, therefore, if you and I will bring fixed principles and strive to be more like Jesus, including his generosity, then we will be living abundantly, not just existing. The Book of Mormon has those fascinating phrases about our moral agency, where we are to act for ourselves and not merely be acted upon. I've often wished that people who use the phrase, take charge of my life, could do so in the context of those scriptures. Now, since we're not always free to choose just when and how all of life's interactions will occur, we are nevertheless free to choose our responses to these moments. Since we can't compute beforehand all our responses, it becomes vital to set our course as immortals on the basis of immortal principles to be applied as reflexively as possible. Besides, there may be no time in which to ponder how we'll respond anyway. If, for example, one determines that he will keep the seventh commandment, then applying this fixed principle will result in temptations either being deliberately avoided in the first place or in being quickly deflected. All of this can be achieved without great thought, risk, or needless anxiety. In fact, I would go so far as to say to you tonight, my brothers and sisters, if we're truly attached to immortal principles, some decisions need to be made only once, really. And then righteous reflexes can do the rest. Absent such fixed determinations, however, one can be tossed to and fro by temptations, which then require case-by-case -case agonizing. The same could be said of honesty in business or integrity in human relationships. Each day, interactions occur relentlessly, involving people and principles and circumstances. One of the things we can do to help us develop those re uh, reflexes is to further develop our scriptural literacy so that as Nephi prescribed, we liken all scriptures unto ourselves. Each day, challenges arise, responses are given, decisions are made. Will it be in a setting of fixed principles, as has been emphasized? The other thing I would say to this, the rising generation of youth and young adults in the church is that scriptural memories, spiritual memories can be lost in a generation. I read to you from the second chapter of Judges. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord nor yet the works he had done for Israel. One generation. When the scriptures are either not available or are not searched and believed, then two things happen, a loss of belief in God and a loss of belief in the resurrection. Omni 1.17. They had brought no records with them, and they denied the being of their creator. King Benjamin's great sermon. Now it came to pass that there were many of the rising generation that could not understand the words of King Benjamin, being little children at the time he spake unto his people. And they did not believe the traditions of their fathers. They did not believe what had been said concerning the resurrection of the dead. Neither did they believe concerning the coming of Christ. Those things always go first and they can go within a generation unless we truly are feasting upon the scriptures. That feasting on the scriptures combined with the gift of the Holy Ghost will show you all things what ye should do. I'd like to testify to you tonight that the scriptures give us nourishment for every season of life and the Holy Ghost can prompt us in those moments so that we can, in fact, be blessed with that insight or reassurance. What happens to feasting on the scriptures? 
Jesus said, the cares of the world choke the word. They surely do. Still worse, there are others who are choked with the pleasures of the world and hence no time for scriptures. Some actually have pleasure in unrighteousness. And here we have again the natural man who gravitates towards the cares of the world and the pleasures of this world. In that cumulative process, today's small inflection for good adds to what becomes tomorrow's mountain of character. A bad inflection, however, of a defining moment gouges a little more in what later becomes the eroded gully which channels us so swiftly into the gulf of misery. More than we realize, life's experiences of boredom, exhilaration, deprivation, conflict, compromise, mistakes, successes, resentments, loving, excluding, belonging, repenting, forgiving, just swirl about us constantly. And it is how immortal principles are applied by immortal individuals in these swirling situations. This is why the plan of salvation is so extremely important and came with the restoration. If we're to understand life and understand the situation I'm attempting to describe tonight. If people misread life, then it leads to murmuring and rebellion and ear religion. Of Laman and Lemuel we read, they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. Decades later in the Book of Mormon, it is said again as if it were a part of the institutional memory of the Nephite and Lamanite people, that Nephi's brethren understood not the dealings of the Lord. Without gospel perspective in our lives, we just won't get it either. And special moments will come and go unused, unnoticed. Even so, how we manage those moments in daily life ends up either developing character or disintegrating character. These moments of truth may be small, but they give us a chance to express character. Mercifully, when we make mistakes, and we will, in these small moments, we can recover and learn from them by faith unto repentance. We cannot, of course, relive a particular moment in our lives, but we can use it as a spiritual spur to remake ourselves. We need not let yesterday hold tomorrow hostage. People always matter, of course. But the more I think about this interplay of immortal individuals and immortal principles, it's almost, brothers and sisters, as though the particular tactical situation is in itself irrelevant. It merely serves as a focal catalyst for what's really going on. Some other tactical situation might have served just as well. In any case, it is for each of us as immortals to make of these moments in daily life what eternal principles would have us do. I am the first to acknowledge that we as church members have a tremendous challenge being equal to our theology and our opportunity. We fall short. We stumble. But if we will arise and continue the climb, the Lord will bless us because we are possessed of truths about things as they really are and things as they really will be. And these truths beckon us, even in our imperfections, to be better. I've determined to share with you tonight, as I near the end of my remarks, what seems to me to be a profound window, a divine disclosure through which we are permitted to look, as is the case with all scriptures, there are many multiple meanings in it. What I wish to derive <clears throat> from that moment in which Enoch was permitted to see in the presence of the Lord the trauma of the people in the time of Noah <clears throat> is something I think useful for us in our 
circumstances from time to time. And the principle to be derived as I read these verses to you is that we do not always weep alone. And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, the Noachians, and the God of heaven wept, and Enoch bore record of it. Got to see God weep, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said further unto the Lord, How is it thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? And the marvelous response from God. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave unto them their knowledge in the day that I created them. And in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency. And unto thy brethren I have said, and also given commandment, that they should love one another, that they should choose me, their father, but behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. Wherefore, continues the Lord, for this shall the heavens weep, yea, and all the workmanship of mine hands. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch all the doings of the children of men. Wherefore, Enoch knew and looked upon their wickedness and their misery, and he wept and stretch forth his arms. And his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. An absolutely supernal, marvelous insight. Our Father in heaven has tenderness even for, for his most mistaken children. And Enoch begins to rejoice when God tells him of Jesus' coming in the meridian of time and the atonement. And he rejoices again when he tells him of the great latter-day restoration. Not always, I'm sure, but more than we know. When we're confronted with the difference between what could be and what is in the human circumstance, we do not weep alone. Now, as I prepare to close, I have felt to add these concluding thoughts. As again, I seek to offer friendship and counsel to you. Do not, my young friends, expect the world to love the seventh commandment, chastity before marriage and fidelity after. Some people in the world will fret genuinely over the consequences of its violation, such as staggering and unprecedented illegitimacy and marital breakdowns. However, sexual immorality per se will still not be condemned by the secular world, as long as the violators have any commendable qualities at all, or as long as they are in some respect politically correct we will have to keep the seventh commandment because it is correct, not because we will get much support from society's other institutions. A second suggestion. As you pursue your discipleship and observe the human scene, do not be surprised or unnerved by the natural man's relentless push for preeminence and power. It really reflects the pre-mortal pre psychodrama. Nor should you be surprised over the efforts of so many to cover their sins or to gratify their vain ambition. Be grateful, therefore, for the gospel's emphasis on meekness. Be careful of the natural man's milder expressions, the craving for credit or rustling for recognition. Alas, so often the hearts and even the moral agency of others can be crushed in the search for self-glorification. We have 
just celebrated the birth at Bethlehem. There is another divine disclosure worth some pondering, and that is the fact that another individual sought the role of Redeemer, saying, Send me, I will be thy son. I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost. Give me thine honor. Now, brothers and sisters, God would never have permitted a different babe to be born at Bethlehem, of course. Nor would he have permitted the destruction of the agency of mankind with all the implications that would carry for a very different mortal experience. What happened, as you know, is that precious Jesus stepped forward and said, Father, thy will be done and the glory be thine forever. That's the babe who was born at Bethlehem. These remarkable restoration windows are there for our instruction in this dispensation and in my opinion, particularly for the last part of this dispensation, if we will ponder over them and make them a part of our discipleship. Lastly, I again express publicly my gratitude for God's having granted me a delay in route. However long, I know it has not been given merely for sightseeing. Perhaps it includes moments like tonight, when I can express my love for you and my confidence in you and my testimony of Jesus, whose work this is, and who has counseled us on the meaning of the mortal experience by the eloquence of his example, and by his having shown the way to us in every particular, including his gallantry when he said of the agonies of the atonement, and would that I might not partake of the bitter cup and shrink. Not shrinking is more important than surviving. And Jesus is the exemplar in every significant way beyond our capacity to express our appreciation for. I salute him for the eloquence of his example. I express my everlasting gratitude to the Father for the superb plan of happiness. And with you, my appreciation for the promptings of the Holy Ghost.